Welcome to Holistic Wisdom Live. Today's episode, I have a special guest, and the topic is Egypt, Mother of Humanity. My guest today is an incredible Egyptian tour guide, Muhammad Ibrahim. I'm going to quickly read his bio, just so you guys know, it doesn't do it justice because this man is remarkable at what he does. The wealth of information, the intuitive guidance that he receives and the open heart is beyond what any words can describe in the bio, but I'm going to read it. <laughs> Muhammad Ibrahim was born in Memphis, Egypt. The surrounding area of his home, hometown includes Saqqara, Dashur, and Abu Sir. He has a degree in Egyptology, and he decided to take his research about ancient Egypt to deeper levels than the mainstream stories. His passion and knowledge enables him to speak about ancient Egypt, inside and outside Egypt. His main job is a tour guide, and he led hundreds of successful tours with many of the world famous speakers. And I have to say, I was honored to be a part of your tour. We just came back less than a week ago, and it is absolutely life-changing. People are like, okay, tell us, tell us. I said, I don't want to share too much because I think I won't do it justice because you are you are what makes the store so remarkable. And I'd love um, for you to start with perhaps your story of recognition, because we're talking about Egypt being the mother of humanity, your recognition of how you recognized that what Egyptian history, world history has been teaching us about human story and the awakening and your own realization of the human story, the actual human story that we're all uncovering in today's day and age. So welcome, Mohammed. Hi, Elena. Hi. Look, at the, my story started uh, when I was 10 years old. Uh, my uh, school uh, took us, um, me and my colleagues, uh, to uh, a trip to Saqqara. And I remember that our first spot in Saqqara, or the, the first part we, we visited was the Serapio. So for uh, people, uh, for kids 10 years old, 10, 12, 11, uh, the Serapio was too much for us. So I had so many questions. I was asking my teacher, hundreds of questions because you saw the Serapium and you felt the energy of the place and the uh, megalithic uh, size of the boxes. So it was like very, very strange for a kid uh, 10 years old. And um, by visiting Saqqara and Dashur, um, which uh, it is very close sites to my uh, family house, I think it, it was about uh, 30 or 40 minutes uh, on foot. Uh, from my house to uh, reach the step pyramid of Saqqara. So that's why many times when I was like having nothing to do, I was walking to Memphis Museum or to Saqqara just to uh, wander around and watching tourists. That is maybe the reason uh, that I decided in the beginning, I wanted to become a tour guide. Then I decided to become a tour guide. So it was not just a dream, it was a decision I took when I was around 12 years old. Uh, so after high school, I uh, applied, uh, I sent my papers to the uh, Helwan University in Cairo, and I became a student in uh, tourism and hotels. That, that is the way to become a tour guide. I could study Egyptology in Ar archaeology uh, academy, but I understood that this will lead me to study ancient Egypt only. But as a tour guide, I studied many levels of uh, the history of Egypt. I studied ancient Egypt, what we mistakenly call it the pharaonic history. I studied uh, Greco-Roman Egypt. I studied Coptic Egypt, uh, Christian Egypt, and Islamic Egypt, and modern Egypt. I studied Egypt till 1952 or 1956, so from thousands of years ago till 1956. And maybe that is one of the big reasons that I can see the big picture. When I uh, look to any uh, tradition or information or kind of uh, something we still practice till now, I can see the development of this uh, 
thing through the ages. And I can understand what kind of changes happened, uh, what kind of, uh, of roots uh, is or that is like deep Egyptian or maybe a little bit affected with Greek or Roman uh, influence. Um, one of the important things happened in my life was uh, a visit to uh, the Hashur, the Pent Pyramid. That I can say that this is the, the beginning of my uh, new way. Uh, I will not say against uh, Egyptology or against the mainstream, but uh, as, I, as you said in, in uh, my story, I, going deeper uh, under the, uh, the regular stories and try to find more explanations uh, about these sites and more functions. So uh, when my professor was explaining that the, the Pint Pyramid was built by amateurs and it was considered as a mistake, that was the critical point for me. I didn't uh, accept this and I didn't agree that this great building uh, can, will be called a mistake because I can see the uh, entire complex is in great shape. They finished the pyramid perfectly. They finished every element, uh, all the, uh, what I can call it accessories of the pyramid or the complex items. And the second important thing in, in my story, I was very good student uh, in the hieroglyphic classes. I was, uh, Maybe the, the early beginning was not good because I didn't understand exactly uh, when, they, uh, when I attended the exams. I didn't want, understood what they want from me to do, okay? Because they, it was a kind of mathematics to look for the, uh, the, the word and then you change it to English and then from English to Arabic. So that was confusing for me. I didn't understand like why that I, I can understand, uh, translate it direct from, uh, hieroglyphic or ancient Egyptian to Arabic. But to use English as a bridge, you lose at least 30 or 40% of the meaning. I can, can give you a clear example now. We have uh, uh, two words in the Egyptian language called nefer, neferu, okay? When you, so there are two, right? When we explain them in English, we explain them in five words, okay? The, beautiful of the beautifuls, okay? It's a, it's a way to say the most beautiful one. So nefer nefru, how about Arabic language? So gamilet el gamilet, still two, and it gives the same meaning. So, mm -hmm. so this is the clear way to explain to you that uh, explaining hieroglyphics or translating hieroglyphics to Arabic, much easier and more understandable than English. So that was my, uh, uh, let's say my talent, because I was very good in the Arabic grammar and the Arabic language, I became very good in the ancient Egyptian language. And that made me read the source of the information. Unfortunately, so many people, millions of people, they buy books about ancient Egypt and they read the information uh, ready, translated from some texts, old texts. And because they don't know the uh, how to read the text itself so they must accept the story even if they have questions but they had no other choice but i had another choice i can read the text and i can uh, have my own understanding and that's why i discovered so many mistakes on, on so many translations so i uh, i started to uh, read uh, 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 topics or texts from the walls and in different temples uh, above obelisk uh, statues, I can easily recognize the names, so I don't need to memorize too much data. Uh, like when you go to a temple, you'll find uh, regular tour guides. They must memorize this room belong to which king and that pillar belong to. I don't do this. I go and I look to the wall, read the name on the wall, so I understand which king is this. Okay, um, and I was lucky to work with so many famous speakers and experts in, in different uh, fields of science, like uh, geology, like uh, physics, uh, engineering, astrology, chemistry. And um, I, I had the great uh, chances to talk with them and to share knowledge with them. 
they enhanced my ideas and my knowledge about ancient Egypt from different aspects. Because uh, before meeting them, I, will, I can call myself as a, a very good tour guide who can read hieroglyphics in a good way and understand history in a good way. But the, uh, the scientific data uh, was not available much in, uh, in the uh, books here in Egypt. And by the way, it's not very easy to get uh, books from uh, outside Egypt. We do get, we like, we can get some, but not easy like uh, if you live in Europe or in uh, America. Uh, so what happened that meeting them, talking to them, touring with them. So I started to know the, uh, the ancient Egyptian uh, great knowledge in uh, physics, in uh, chemistry, biology, zoology, uh, uh, engineering, okay. Uh, so I started to collect information and more information, different uh, fields, different uh, subjects. Uh, so that enhanced my knowledge in a great way. So you can say now I combine between the, uh, the uh, historical uh, uh, stories, what I call, call it mainstream history, which happened. I don't deny that this history uh, didn't happen or, or happened. It happened, but there is older history. So when we say the Egyptian civilization is 5,000 or 7,000 years old, that is not true. The Egyptian history is much older than this, hundreds of thousands of years. And uh, the, my main research nowadays is prehistoric Egypt. And I managed to collect uh, thousands of information and data about the existence of mankind in Egypt uh, hundreds of thousands of years ago. I love that. And I wanted to talk about, because there is definitely a great distinction, as you said, the reference in the history books to Egypt, which they talk about that the slaves build the pyramids. And I want to briefly touch upon that and how, you know, for us, of course, I already going in uh, to Egypt, I already knew that that wasn't true. But just so people can understand the size of the blocks and how it is really impossible for somebody from 10,000 years ago to have been able to build that or 5,000 years ago, because to this day, we, there is not even one uh, type of equipment that exists that is capable of doing that. So perhaps you can kind of break down the story of, um, of slaves building Egypt and really go into the ancient technologies that existed and this is the expansion and going into the true human history. It is not fair at all. And this is one of the biggest mistakes or lies about uh, the, the Egyptian civilization when we say slaves built uh, the pyramid or the pyramids. Mm -hmm. And um, who is saying this is ignorant 100%. Why? They don't know any data about, uh, let's talk about the Great Pyramid as an example. We talk about almost 2,500,000 blocks of stones. Uh, the smallest stone is around 1.5 ton. We talk about 1,500 uh, kilograms. Uh, so we 2.5 million blocks. Some of these blocks uh, are more than 100 ton, especially in the higher levels, like the granite blocks at the uh, king, so-called king chamber. Okay, uh, if slaves built the Great Pyramid, it won't be called the Great Pyramid. If slaves built the, the pyramid, the precision will not be like what we can see. The, uh, the size of the blocks, the, uh, the accuracy of the angles, the air shafts, which points to, uh, each, each one is pointing to a solar system, the facts, if we, if we look to the pyramid from uh, all kinds of signs, you will find the pyramid is, the Great Pyramid is considered at the top of, uh, of, of this kind of science. If we talk about chemistry, if we talk about physics, if we talk about geography, the pyramid is exactly uh, dividing uh, our planet into two sections in a perfect way. So we must use the pyramid line as the, the timeline, not Greenwich line, so the pyramid line is the most accurate timeline for uh, mankind on earth. 
uh, so many st statistics about the pyramid. Slaves can do something big, I don't deny this, but it will not be precise like the Great Pyramid and like so many other uh, sites and other uh, constructions in Egypt. Uh, I can tell you that there was no slaves in ancient Egypt. This is another lie. Ancient Egypt, even when they took prisoners during wars, it was different uh, system and they used them to uh, exchange with other prisoners. Okay, so I don't need to explain this, but it is very clear. The pyramid, the Great Pyramid, and all the other megalithic sites in Egypt were built with superior technology. And as you said, uh, we don't have, and, and I'm saying this, and, I, and I'm very clear because I remember uh, Christopher Dunn, uh, famous English-American engineer, he told me, Muhammad, be careful when you say this. What I was going to say, that I was going to say, our technology cannot do this. So he told me, be careful when you say this, because our technology is great. Of course, I cannot deny this. But when it comes to the Great Pyramid, I can say it without fear. Our technology cannot build something like the Great Pyramid. Why I'm saying this? Because we have two examples. One, we call it the Japanese Pyramid or the Japanese Experiment, uh, 1978. They wanted to build a pyramid, very small size, about 16 meters high, okay? And they failed. And another experiment, experiment we call it Nova Pyramid, similar experiment, they wanted to build a smaller pyramid also, and they failed, okay? Uh, they failed twice, each experiment. The first failure when they tried to apply the manual techniques to build the pyramid, and they failed again when they used machines and they couldn't build a pyramid with such precision, okay? It was just a bunch of blocks above each other and that's it. So uh, the, uh, the story of slaves, this is completely wrong. And uh, I don't know who or how they can bring something like this to the table of discussion. Yeah, it's incredible that it's, it is part of the discussion still. But I think we're living right now through the way age of revelations. And this is where I think what you do is so incredible is you are literally at the precipice of awakening and revealing those people that are curious and are open that are coming to Egypt to reveal what is hidden. And for me, the biggest, one of many revelations was the stories that have been written on the walls of temples, the true stories of humanity, which blew my mind. The amount of information that has been left on these walls tell a story and the question that I have you said that you know how many I remember you you share 26,000 hieroglyphics you know is that what it is exactly the symbols uh, in the ancient Egyptian language yes are, are more than 20,000 wow it's amazing but most most Egyptologists can't even translate it or read it correct look when you study Egyptology you mainly study history and archaeology okay uh, uh, some other subjects are considered separate studies. So uh, to read hieroglyphics or ancient Egyptian language, you must have that separate study. But uh, as a student of Egyptology, you can learn a little bit. You can learn like, like uh, if we can call it minor subject, okay? So they can read a little bit, the famous uh, texts, um, maybe 5% or less. But to be an expert in uh, the ancient Egyptian language, no, that is completely separate study, like uh, studying also religion in ancient Egypt, studying literature in ancient Egypt, uh, studying art. These are all separate studies. Okay. But the good thing that for me, uh, I was studying all of this. Okay. Also, not in, in, a, in a big way, but I was enhancing my uh, knowledge by keep studying these uh, uh, extra subjects. Uh, and because I loved uh, these subjects. And uh, again, I was lucky that my professors in these subjects were the, the best professors. Like the, my professor, Nuruddin, was number one in Egypt and maybe in the world at the time uh, in, in the Egyptian language. He's not famous, unfortunately, but he was the best one. So he made it so easy for me, for my colleagues and I, 
so that's why I still uh, appreciate, uh, I can call it a favor, I appreciate that favor teaching us not only how to read hieroglyphics, but how to understand between the lines. Because hieroglyphic is like coded language. You can understand the first, when you read it for the first time, you can get uh, uh, the meaning. But if you read it again, you will get deeper meaning. If you keep reading the same text, you will find more information and more meanings. So that's why uh, I can tell you this language is very, very rich language. Mm. All right. I wanted to show something because uh, you, you have some slides prepared and I wanted to show. But before I do, quickly, something I wanted to share that I learned, which I didn't know, is the Great Pyramid's location is at the center of Earth's landmass, which is unbelievable that they actually the ancient civiliz you know, civilizations, the, the beings that created this, had this knowledge and how aligned, precisely aligned everything was. So I wanted you to touch quickly upon that center, if, if it has any other significance, which I know it's linked to the sarcophagus and the feeling in there. Yeah, of course, uh, the famous story about Orion built, okay, the three stars of Orion, the three pyramids of Giza, uh, are doing two things. The first thing, they are aligned together one after the other, exactly the same X or the same angle or the same diameter of the three stars uh, of Orion. Two are, uh, are the same uh, uh, diameter and the third of center and the, the base of it touches the, the, the line, okay? The same thing happening with the three pyramids. If you go there and you cross from the north uh, east corner, it is exactly the same line leading to the north uh, eastern corner of the second pyramid. But it doesn't do this with the third pyramid. It touches the, the northwest corner of uh, the Mankaura pyramid. So the first person who realized this is called Robert Bouval, and he, he wrote a book about it. So that is the first thing, that the three pyramids are uh, aligned similar uh, to or, or they have the same shape or the same alignment uh, of uh, like Orion, the three stars. And the second thing that the three stars themselves in certain time, they come above the pyramid. So they are aligned uh, above the pyramid, the, the three pyramids, okay? And that's why when we talk about 26,000 BC, uh, the time of the uh, building these pyramids, uh, which I agree and disagree at the same time. I agree, yes, it is true, but that is not a way to say the pyramid were built at that time. No, they existed. They were there at that time. So they were built in an earlier time. And we can apply this to older cycle or older cycle. So we may talk about 200,000 years, maybe 500,000, maybe 1 million years old, maybe older, okay? Mm -hmm. And, and every time you uh, uh, study the pyramid, you will find something extra, something new. Like nowadays, they, uh, two weeks ago, they released uh, the, this information that they found a kind of an entrance, okay, or a big room inside the pyramid. Uh, my belief that this uh, entrance or room leads to another room behind, okay? So maybe in the near future, we will know uh, more about what is inside the grid, what is hidden inside the grid pyramid, okay? So every time you study the Egyptian uh, sites, you will find more and more. Hmm. The other thing that I was fascinated to learn is that pyramids are not peaks at the top, they're actually flat. Yes, may, okay, uh, this is maybe my opinion. Okay, but um, I must say that this is not uh, for all the pyramids. Okay, uh, the Great Pyramid for sure, but maybe the second pyramid, maybe not. Okay, third pyramid for sure. Uh, some pyramid yes, and pyramids yes, and some pyramids no. It depends on what depends on the function of the pyramid. The, some pyramids needs need to have missing peak or, or like wide flat top because they receive. Uh, from the sky, so they need to have like a, a flat top. Some other pyramids send instead of receiving, so they have pointed top, okay? So it's not the same. And by the way, we don't have three or 10 or 20 pyramids only. We, if we put together 
all the uh, the, the pyramids was missing uh, pieces. Some pyramids, unfortunately, lost the whole structure above the ground, and we still have the underground foundation. So if we count all of them, we are talking about 127 pyramids. Mm. OK. Yes. So they are not doing the same function. They are doing different functions. And that will lead me to explain to you, and I believe I did during the tour, that there is no, there are no two pyramids are identical. All of them are different. Even if they look close to each other, like the, the Great Pyramid and uh, the, pin, the, the Red Pyramid at Dashur, from a distance, they look like each other. But no, uh, the height, the angle, the width, the base, the interior design, they are all different because each one is doing different functions from the other. Mm. And you also mentioned that underneath these pyramids, it's sort of like an empty, empty space, right? Do you want to talk a little bit about that as well? Yes. When we talk about uh, this huge building above the ground, we must understand that, it, that there is huge space under the ground. Uh, that space, sometimes uh, huge like uh, Saqqara, under the step pyramid of Saqqara, there is a huge shaft, almost eight by eight uh, and 28 meters uh, under the ground. And there is another layer uh, goes till 50 meters under the ground. Uh, when we talk about Abu Rawash, north of Giza and uh, Abu, uh, uh, Abu Sir and Zawit al Aryan, south of Giza, so we can see clearly huge foundation under the ground. But if we take the uh, Giza Plateau as an example, the Great Pyramid was not built above flat ground as most of the people, not all the pyramids, not only the Great Pyramid, they were not built above flat ground. They were built above a small uh, design. We can call it the horizon shape. There's like two sides and hollow space in between. That hollow space, uh, most of the cases goes very deep under the ground. Uh, the case of the Great Pyramid, so we took uh, at least uh, the, the descending passage is about uh, 85 meters. So if we uh, took about almost 15 maybe or, or uh, 20 meters of the pyramid itself, so it goes at least 60 meters under the bedrock. Uh, that kind of depth and uh, uh, space under the pyramid, in my opinion, it connects the pyramid and earth together. So as, as if the pyramid is plugged into earth, uh, uh, very close to the energy of earth, and also because of the upper structure, very close to the, the sun and close to air. So we talk about the uh, three main elements, uh, earth and fire, which is the sun, air, okay, and uh, then dust uh, or uh, the uh, the surrounding field around the pyramid. Uh, close to Mother Earth means close to magnetism, close to uh, also nitrogen, okay. So the, the pyramid, if we talk about the, the mechanism of the pyramid, the pyramid can use or part of the function of the pyramid using these elements. Uh, is that if we talk about uh, producing energy or producing something else, uh, that depth and getting close to Mother Earth is helping the function of the pyramid. Mm. So when we went climbing, for example, down, descending in the bent pyramid, because that was pretty steep, 85 meters, is that down or where where were we? Where uh, was it? It was down. Remember, was down. we went straight <laughs> and then we went to the left side. Yeah. Yes, is what we call it the subterranean. That was the subterranean. Okay. What do you feel are the functions of those pyramids? Ah, that is. <laughs> I'm going straight for it. <laughs> um, okay, I will tell you my own feeling. Yes. Uh, what what I feel when I go there, and uh, I will tell you what I. Uh, 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 shared with, uh, or what they shared with me, uh, so many of the, the experts and speakers. Um, because I have been to Giza pyramids uh, thousands of times, either in public visit, 
uh, or private residence. Uh, so I will tell you my own feeling, especially during the private residence. The, uh, the Great Pyramid and the, the other two pyramids, every time I go, I feel that they scan my body. They deal with my body in, in a special way. Uh, uh, and not only my body and also my my soul okay uh, every time i go there it's something like um like a gate or a portal okay because truly when you go inside the pyramid you are disconnected with everything okay especially when i go with small group i feel this uh, when i go small group or when they if i have big group and they leave uh, and I take the chance that the last five or 10 minutes I'm alone inside the king chamber or inside the pyramid. So I feel that the pyramid is a way to ascend or to go somewhere. So it's, it's a beginning of a journey. Uh, that journey is leading to somewhere. I'm not sure where exactly. Okay. But I, I heard many stories uh, and I can tell you, I don't deny any of them i accept all of them because i don't have any way to say no or yes but they all make sense to me okay even when some people talk about going to a star system going to the Pleiades. okay um, also i feel that there is great uh, healing energy from the great pyramid especially when i go to that room under the pyramid the subterranean room uh, going to the queen chamber uh, is the place where I feel the balance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Many people will tell you, I feel nothing. No, th that is not true. They don't feel nothing. They feel the balance. So as if it is nothing. Okay. Because they feel very strong energy underneath and the very strong energy above. Okay. If they go outside without visiting the queen chamber, they will have like a little bit uh, not problem, but unstable energy for a while. But if they visit the queen chamber, that is the balance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I have a, a very strange experience happened to me uh, oh. six years ago. I had a big group and we uh, opened the three permits uh, together in one night. So I was moving to check uh, everything is okay, going inside the first and then the second, the third, and uh, walking back to the first and then walking to the second, the third. I was doing this all night because of the, uh, the there were four groups and each group supposed to visit the three pyramids. So we talk about uh, 12 uh, hours. So it was from 4 p.m. to 4 a.m. in the following day. Okay. Um, I can tell you that I, I was exhausted. I was uh, stressed because of the of the of the style or uh, it was responsibility to make sure that everything is correct no mistakes but i started to feel um, the result when i went back home and uh, as if i and i like crashed on my bed i didn't have the chance even to change or anything um, and i i left early i left around uh, 2 a.m uh, the last group was inside the last pyramid and i was feeling that it, it is okay so nothing wrong will happen they already inside and my team can uh, finish the job they'll just take them out and send them to the hotel so i left early uh, i live close to the pyramid so i think i was here around uh, 2 30 in the morning so that was the time when i was uh, above my bed okay I found myself staring to the ceiling. I was not asleep. And, uh, and then I realized that there is no ceiling. I was staring uh, up. So I thought I was dreaming. So my mind was uh, struggling. My mind was also fighting the idea. Okay. I was keep telling myself, it's a dream. It's a dream. And I wanted to touch the bed. I didn't feel the bed. Okay. So it took me a while I, until suddenly I saw the ceiling again. And I, uh, I felt the bed, but the, uh, the, the time was nine in the morning, it was not 2.30. Okay, so something strange happened. Uh, it, it, I had the same experience again, or, or the same situation, but not the same experience. 
I let's say maybe I was not afraid, but I, I didn't want to continue to do this again. I had the chance, I had a big group again uh, in 2021. And uh, they had the, the same thing uh, almost uh, all night. Okay, uh, three permits during the night. But I didn't do the same thing. Uh, maybe I was not ready for this experience again. But if, it, if I have the chance to do it again, I will do it. I think I am getting ready uh, because some kind of changes happened uh, for me in the uh, last two years. Because when you talk about these things, I was uh, trying to explain it first from um, uh, the um, facts, okay, from uh, uh, physical facts, okay. I was not trying or I was not accepting the spiritual explanation okay also i was not denying this but i was trying to put everything uh, uh, in the frame of physical evidence physical evidence okay but uh, i don't do this anymore now. <laughs> yes i of course i i uh, talk about so many things from the, the that kind of physical point of view but so many things now I tell my people, this is my own feeling, this is my intuition, this is uh, my, uh, uh, my understanding. And uh, I feel or I see that they accept uh, what I share with them. Yes, it's almost like it's a circuit, right? The three pyramids were a circuit and you were activated uh, in that circuitry. You know, for me, I can just speak a couple of minutes I had in the sarcophagus and I can say that it was such a profound experience, you know, because you were right there with me. And I said, oh my gosh, I felt it was an energy of coming home. And I've never in this reality have ever experienced that feeling. And all I know is after leaving, I thought I have to go back, but it's almost like there was nothing underneath me, even though I was laying in that sarcophagus, the bottom, I didn't even feel the bottom. I didn't feel anything. It was just free floating in space. And then when I realized when you said that it's the, the very center, that pyramid location is the very center of the landmass of the earth, I thought, okay, it also feels like womb space and maybe it's the umbilical cord. I don't know. You know, is it the umbilical cord of the earth? It is a portal for sure. Uh, it's definitely worth exploring. And I know I can't wait to go back to really just be in that space and allow for, for the energy to guide people and that's the thing is like when you're being in the science which is great it's important to understand the science but it's also just as important to allow for the intuitive uh, aspect that we all have to guide us to the science because that I think is how we get to prove a lot of the physical things is by allowing our intuition to guide us into places that the rational mind not necessarily is there for us to see would you say that that is the experience you're having as well? Mm -hmm. And by the way, when we are in places uh, full of granite, rose granite, so we talk about a uh, material full of quartzite. And uh, the quartzite, or the quartz, sorry, full of quartz. And quartz is a great material for uh, sending and receiving, for transmission. So that is, is what is happening to us. Some people, but I, I think few, they can feel it very good. They can uh, understand uh, what is happening. Uh, but the majority of us, we feel, we feel the uh, the field, uh, but we we don't get the uh, the meaning easy. Like like if you are listening to a radio but with unknown language. So that what was happening to us. So all the frequencies were hitting our uh, bodies from all the sides because of the quartz everywhere, okay? So it was like strong flow of frequencies and energies. Um, but by doing this many times, okay, you will be able to understand better. You will be able to recognize, your body will be familiar, so it will not be under a, a kind of a shock or uh, it won't be too much like the first time. Mm. So the inside is rose quartz and the outside of the pyramids is built out of limestone, correct? Right. Okay. Limestone is uh, for conductivity. Conduct. Limestone is a very good material for uh, electricity. 
conductive to electricity. Mm -hmm. And the chambers of when we were going down, they're also limestone, correct? Exactly. Okay. Because the pyramid need to be, as I said, plugged in to be connected with electricity. Okay. And that is charging the quarters of the uh, of the king room inside the pyramid, almost in the middle level. Yes, I wanted to pull up a couple of slides. Let me just pull up this, and then we'll just share them on the screen. Let's see which one. Which one would you like for me to pull up and talk about? Choose one of these vases. Vases. Okay. Let's do. Let's do this one. Okay. Here yes, we that one he chose is very good. Okay. Can okay. you see? Okay, you can see it on the screen. Okay, good. Let's let's talk about this vase. Okay. Can you make it uh, bigger? Because I'm it is kinda, yes, I know. It's let me see how to do that. Okay, let me bring this down. Yes, here we go. Bigger, bigger than this? Yes. Okay, let's, let me see. Mm, it won't let me expand it. Uh, let me see. Yes, I can do that. Here we go. Is that good? Uh, I still don't see it. I think you, you see it, but I don't see it. It is oh. not. Oh, oh. Shared. Oh my gosh, so sorry. Okay, here we ah, go. Okay. <laughs> I was showing it to myself only. Okay, apologies. This is a very uh, interesting piece. This is a pottery uh, jar from uh, red clay uh, from a time we call it Nakada. Nakada is um, uh, what we can call it culture before the Egyptian civilization. So Nakada was around uh, 5,000, from 6,000 to 5,000 BC. Okay, uh, that is very important because now we describe that Nakada is uh, a beginning of civilization, one of the very early beginning. And Nakada, uh, the techniques and the tools were primitive. Okay, because we need this when we see the next picture. Okay, let's go for the next. But no, wait a minute. What is interesting about this that all these fig figurines or the uh, design are ladies, mm. okay? As if they try to uh, tell us something about the importance of the female at the time. And uh, if you read the Egyptian uh, philosophy and the Egyptian uh, texts in a good way, you will find that so many of the powerful uh, figures and uh, entities in ancient Egypt were females, like Sekhmet, like uh, Hatur, like Isis. Of course, there are strong uh, and powerful males, but the, all the, uh, the supporting powers and all the, uh, if we can call them the containers, uh, the, uh, the bases of powers are females. So that is one of the uh, uh, messages they were uh, trying to tell each other that let's support or let's take the uh, stick with the energy of the female. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. The next one, tell me which one we should pick. How about on, yes, exactly. Okay. Let me now make sure I'm sharing it on the screen. Should they be next to each other? Do you want them next to yes. each other? Okay. Okay, when I say that the Egyptian civilization is older than uh, 7,000 uh, BC, 5,000 of course, and 7,000, also older than 9,000, and older than 10,500 BC. So why I'm saying this? What kind of evidence I use? Uh, this jar is one of many, one of thousands of jars. We found this jar, side by side with another primitive jar. This jar is made from a stone. We call it prophetic stone. It is hard stone close to granite. The same hardness or maybe close, very close to the hardness of granite. So we took about six uh, in, in Moss scale. That scale is from zero to 10. Zero is talc, the powder. 
10 is diamond. This one is six amoxicillin. So this is very solid material, okay? So how come someone can convince us that the, the, the people who made the primitive jar from uh, clay and pottery are the same people who made this jar? That is impossible to understand this or to accept this. Because we talk about people, they could hardly do uh, a kind of art. You can see the art is very primitive. Uh, no pottery wheel uh, was invented yet. Uh, there is no way to see any kind of tools or um, any kind of technology. But when you look to that prophetic jar, you will find the, the precision is perfect, the sides, the, the polishment, uh, the holes, the, uh, the rim, everything is perfect as if it was made by a modern machine. So how come we, we understand or how come we uh, fix this problem? that these two pieces were found together inside one room, one uh, two. The only solution or the, the only convincing idea that people who made the poor art found this high quality uh, uh, vase and they kept it with them. So if they found it, it means it was made by earlier uh, civilization and that civilization, according to geology, ended was ended at 10,500 BC. Okay. okay. Uh, let's go. This to, is before the or this is before the flood. The flood was 9,700 BC. So this is before the what we call it the solar cat cataclysm or solar disaster. Okay. 10,500 BC. Yes. All right, let's look at the next one. Okay. Which one? One underneath. Underneath. Okay. All right. Oh, I need to share it. That's right. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is another challenging piece, uh, challenging for also for our modern technology. This is one piece from uh, a material called alabaster. Alabaster, or we can call it rock crystal. This is not hard material uh, because it is like, if I can say it this way, it is close to glass. So the, the tool we need to, uh, to use, it must be very efficient and delicate tool in the same time, okay? Because to deal with uh, or to use a strong pressure on alabaster, it will break it. And you can see the edges are very uh, thin and very delicate. So there was a machine made all the uh, edges from one single piece of a stone. Uh, I'm not only talking about how it was made, but also why. Why we have a kind of a plate with one, two, three, four uh, edges like this. Okay. Uh, so there is no explanation, uh, but the design of this piece is showing not only high technology, but also superior technology. And why I'm saying superior technology? Because sometimes when you deal with hard stones, you can use force, you can use pressure, okay? Uh, so maybe we can talk about primitive tools, but used by uh, talented uh, workers. But this one, no. This one needs precise or needs high quality tools needs very sensitive tools. And these tools cannot be called, or we cannot use uh, chisels or uh, pounders or other kind of similar tools to, to do something like this. Now, we need very uh, high efficient uh, drills and uh, core drills to cut something like this. It may be even better than uh, drills and core drills. So, okay. so this is another smoking gun of that superior civilization or, or higher, uh, the advanced civilization I'm talking about. Okay, let's go to some more slides, okay. Yes, we can go to the jar, the, the one- uh, At the top? This, this one. Well, let me share my screen, here we go, okay. 
I call this the miracle, okay? This one is a great challenge also to our uh, uh, technology. I think if we can do this nowadays, it will be so expensive because it is not just the design from outside, but also it is hollow from inside, the same shape like outside. So it, it is the same space. Uh, I saw many uh, similar uh, uh, pieces uh, made in modern days and the cut from inside is like, like vertical cut. So they, they put the drill down or inside and it drills to make like a small uh, hole or like it looks like a small shaft. But this one and so many other like this, it is hollow from inside and, and the, the space it matches the, the, the shape. You know what I'm talking about? It is hollow, yes. completely hollow, okay? Yeah. So we talk about two impossible things. The first thing is how they change it from narrow space to wide space. So what kind of tool they send inside and it gets bigger in, when it goes after the neck. Number two, this is still alabaster. So this is not hard stone. This is a little bit fragile stone. So by drilling or uh, hollowing the, uh, the space, they can crack the outside, the, the wall, which is thin. I think they, that the, 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 the side of the wall is around maybe five millimeters, which is not very strong, unless they have, again, another superior tool to do this. And it was for them like a piece of cake. It was very easy. But for us, this is very difficult to do. And it not only very difficult to do, and it is risky mission, as I call it. You can ask many factories processing alabaster to do something like this. Most of them will refuse. Why? Because it can be cracked or uh, destroyed easily during the, uh, the manufacture. So they will keep losing money because if to do one, they may lose or destroy 10. So that is not uh, a win-win game. So they will refuse our request if we ask them to do something. Mm. Yes. Mm. All right, let's see some next ones. And this is again from that old era, Nakada and before Nakada. So this is before 5000 BC. Okay. Which image would you like? Uh, there is, so let's finish the jars, all the jars. Okay. Uh, okay, this one. Let me bring it up here. Okay, here we go. Okay, this is another challenge. Uh, it is made from uh, a material also not very strong. And, and this, is, this is the key, uh, because some people can tell you it is not so strong so they can carve this. I agree with them. But if we talk about uh, regular design, if we talk about uh, a design which is not perfect and, and not symmetrical design like what we can see, to do this symmetrical design, it requires so many uh, uh, movement, okay? Uh, and and uh, if I can call it chiseling. And this is again the same thing because it's a fragile material called slate. Uh, it can be cracked easily. And you can see some cracks because it was found on the ground, maybe it fall off uh, or uh, when they were uh, trying to find it, maybe it was broken because I'm, that is what I'm saying. It is fragile material. It is can easily broken from a very uh, uh, low level of pressure, unlike granite, okay? And also when you look from the top, you will see it is perfectly hollow from inside. So the same question, how did and was what uh, tool they managed to uh, do it? By the way, this kind of hand, it takes the shape of a hand, like it's like an arm and the top part, but maybe the picture doesn't show this. They made the shape of a hand touching the, the rim. Okay, mm -hmm. fingers are very clear. Okay. So again, it's the same time period with yes. this ancient, ancient advanced technology. All right, um, I think this piece. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, right? It's a plate. Okay, let me see what this is. Please. Again, we talk about alabaster, but this time we see that the, the walls of the, the plate, it takes the shape of a kind of a bend, okay? As if they wanted to create a star or, or similar shape. Uh, we don't know how this was made, okay? Uh, if if they managed to uh, melt the, the material and the, to press it from the sides, which I don't agree with this, the only way to explain it that they have a tool to carve the sides and to create the shape. So this is because of a small uh, drill. So they managed to carve. And, and again, if you look to the, the edge, you can see it's about two millimeters, I think, two or maximum three millimeters. So we are talking about very delicate material, okay? Alabaster is like half glass, half stone. So any extra pressure can break it very easy. But they are telling us, no, the tool they have is a superior tool, can do the job easily, and they were not afraid of doing something like this. And the same time period also, we talk about 5,000 uh, years old. Okay. Yes. Okay, let's look here. There's some hieroglyphics here. <clears throat> Do we want to go there or where would where should we go? Okay, uh, the uh, falcon in, uh, in in this square. This one, the black and white. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay. Yes, this is a name, by the way, it's not a picture. The square, we call it het or hat, and the falcon is hor. Uh, the, in uh, the Greeks, add s to hor became horus. But we read it hor, so we read the name het hor, which is hatur. This is the name of our beloved Netzer, and the word Netzer is the word they explain it wrongly as god or goddess. Hatur is the shelter of the, the power of the meal or the shelter of the meal, the womb of the meal, the protector of the meal. Uh, Hatur temple in uh, at Dandara is one of the most beautiful temples in Egypt. When you go there, you feel uh, great energy. Um, no one in any level of, uh, of uh, the academic studies or alternative stories, no one is denying that this temple was used for healing because the ancient Egyptian stories and all the stories through the Egyptian history till 1900 AD talk about uh, the healing power of Hatur temple, of the Ndara temple. And I believe you and everybody else who visited this temple, they felt the energy of Hatur temple. So that is Absolutely. her meaning. Yes, and what's amazing is when you walked into the temple, there is the center panel that's all painted with wings. Mm -hmm. uh, Hatur is um, it the, the uh, representation or it is the main temple exists almost in every temple. Uh, there are other temples dedicated to uh, Horus, to Ra, to Isis, uh, to uh, Osiris. You will always find Hatur as main repeated element in all these temples. Because anywhere we talk about healing energy, we must find Hatur. Beautiful. All right, the next. The other black and white hieroglyphic, it is her name. Okay, in, in a different way. Yes, let me choose it. Here we go. Yes. Yes. So we can see the uh, the square, which is now it's like a, a rectangular room, or that is the shape of the, uh, the external wall of the temple with face, the face of a human, okay? Um, and the face here, in my opinion, the face and the head, okay, it represents the, the consciousness. Uh, the, the symbol under the face is what we call it R, letter R, 
the uh, outlines of the lips. And R uh, is explained as resonant sound, okay, repeated sound. And then this is the figure on the right side that is for Hatur. Uh, Hatur, one of the um, of the uh, connected uh, powers of, of uh, they call Hatur the lady of music. Okay, um, that is not accurate one hundred percent. She is the lady of resonant, the lady of sound. Yes, music. I agree with this, but I don't agree that it is music for entertainment. No, it is music for healing. So that is Hatu, the lady of the healing music or the healing resonant or the healing sound. It's interesting when you talk about that temple, I just realized you brought it up that all of the mouths were removed from the yeah. statues. Exactly. Because sound, this, what is sound? Sound is a wave and it keeps going. That's why you say if you uh, take a spaceship and you go faster than sound, uh, millions of, uh, of miles, uh, you can then uh, capture or receive signals of all the transmissions like 1960, 1940, okay? The sound doesn't, doesn't disappear. So when they destroy the nose and the mouth as if they destroy the, uh, the openings for life, okay? For sound, uh, for uh, the, the uh, the, the main uh, interest uh, for uh, life forces. And sound is one of the important uh, life forces according to the belief, uh, beliefs of the ancient Egyptians. Hmm. Yes. All right, let's do a few more. <laughs> okay, here we go. Which one should we look at now? Let's go to the uh, these, these figurines. Yeah, the uh, vintage. Uh, the yes, here. This, one. this is the famous guy of ancient Egypt, uh, known by many names. Uh, Toth or uh, Tohuti, uh, called also Jehuti if it is in a baboon shape, uh, known uh, by the Greeks as Hermes. Uh, also known in uh, some of the biblical uh, stories as Enoch, okay. Uh, some people call him Tos the Atlantean. Uh, many names for Tos or Tohut. Tohut is the, the symbol of knowledge, the symbol of uh, wisdom. And he the one who knows uh, where and how and when. It, the one who also uh, the first one in Egypt, or the one who taught the Egyptians to use the pen to write and to start recording their stories and their uh, knowledge, uh, either on the walls or on papyrus uh, or other uh, things like leather or something else. Uh, Tos uh, represents uh, great wisdom as uh, the bird, Ibis bird, the ancient Egyptian realized that it, it walks on uh, above the ground on the uh, Egyptian fields and suddenly uh, stab his peak deep under the ground and catches a worm. So they uh, consider this as a great sense and uh, great knowledge because um, how did the, the bird know and also how the, 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 the location where they step the peak, okay, is the right location. So that's why I'm saying he, the one who knows when and how and why. Okay. And what is he holding in his hand? I see an unk, and what is this other staff? What is that? All the male knitters uh, of ancient Egypt, like Horus, like Ra, and other uh, uh, knitters are holding this scepter, we call it was scepter, W-A-S-S. Was -S. scepter is originally the scepter of Set. The one was considered as the evil knitter or the, the evil member of the family. And I don't agree with this, he was not evil. He was troublemaker, yes, but he was one important person of the family of Ra. 
So that is his scepter, the powerful scepter of uh, was of uh, of set called was scepter. Okay, and you said that they all have it. Let's just look at a couple of more images here. Okay. Oh yes, this one because I've seen this one on the walls, and I was curious about it. So people will probably be curious too. Okay. Okay. Sometimes you see uh, all all of it or all, the whole person in black, and I joke with my uh, clients, and I tell this is Darth Vader. <laughs> okay, but this is the the, uh, the human body with the head of a scarab. This is called Kipper. The, the, the whole being is called Kipper. This is uh, the the symbol of new beginning, new identity, new chance, new life. Uh, rebirth. The first cycle of the sun, the sun during dawn time, or the moment before dawn time is Kibber. So Kibber is always representing uh, new beginnings. Mm -hmm. uh, many people, uh, they give you a small blue scarab in Egypt and they say good luck. No, it is not about good luck. It's about new beginning. So anything you want to start from zero, or you want to finish it and restart, it, it will be Kipper. Mm. And he's using the same scepter, the vast scepter. Yes, and then the last one here is, is that Isis. Oh, hold on, let me just share my screen here. Okay. Okay. This one can be called Hatur, can be called Isis also. Mm. If there is a chair above the solar disk, it will be for sure Isis. Without the chair, so we are confused. Maybe Hatur, maybe Isis. But uh, most of the cases will be Hatur here in this shape. Uh, but because we said Isis, so Isis is an important uh, symbol in ancient Egypt. That is the Greek way to call her name. Isis is not the correct way. Her name in the Egyptian language is Isset. Is set that is the right way, and we must end the name with T. And by the way, all the female words in ancient Egypt must have T at the end, yeah. except one name, Hatur, is the only female name without T at the end. The opposite, all the male names in ancient Egypt doesn't have or don't have T at the end, except another exception, Set is a man, but with T at the end. So Isis or Iset is the power of the lady. That is her name, the lady. And she is the power behind her uh, husband, according to the story, uh, her husband, Osiris. And she is also the power behind her uh, son, Horus. And the most interesting thing of the, the name Horus, that his title is always written this way, Horus, son of Isis. In uh, most of the writings about Horus, they mention him as Horus, son of Isis, not Horus, son of, of Osiris, mm -hmm. because he is trying to connect with the power of the lady. Because to be uh, the or to follow patriarchy, that is not correct. So ancient Egypt understood that to focus on Horus only, that is not helping them. So they tried to connect between Horus and his mother many times and between Horus and Hatur also in uh, other cases. Mm. Yes, so this is, it's right now we're also at the time, at the precipice of time when the divine feminine and masculine are coming and seeking for the balance. It's all about right. balancing the energies. Exactly, and that's why the name Hatur, it is a mix of female and male together. Mm. Plus, pay attention. We must mix the two powers. Yes. We shall take the side of the matriarchy or the side of patriarchy. Both are wrong. We mm -hmm. must find between the two powers. Yes. One other thing I wanted to say that blew my mind is that temples had images of levitation, levitating temples. So you could see that there's definitely energies that were involved in showing how that was possible. And perhaps some of the megalithic, huge, you know, megaton 
stones that was probably moved, right, were probably moved from a, one location, you said 700 kilometers away, right, from the quarry site. So maybe mm -hmm. you can briefly touch upon that because it is shown in the temples that this is something that was done. Yes, uh, in many temples, we, we can see that the king is sending a kind of beams or energy uh, to uh, uh, a design we know that this design is the temple and they as if they show us a, a, a short story in two or three or sometimes four uh, pictures or, or uh, steps the first picture is the, that design the temple above the ground level no energy and no beams then the second picture will be the king holding this energy beam and uh, the temple is surrounded by this energy and slightly above the ground. And then picture number three, we see the temple started to elevate till maybe the knees uh, or the thighs of the king. And if there is picture number four, it goes to close to the neck between the neck and the belly button of uh, the king, okay? So it is very clear, they talk about uh, gravity control, okay? Many people are saying, no, it is a kind of a spiritual uh, levitation. I say, okay, like I don't deny this. It can be this way, but it is a very important uh, way to understand that the ancient Egyptians understood levitation. And uh, if we admit that this was spiritual, okay, why it why we deny it was also physical levitation because this is the only solution to talk about how they lifted these obelisks 700 ton from the quarry uh, at aswan they moved the obelisk uh, from the quarry to cairo or to luxor and there is other cases of smaller or bigger blocks like we have statues 500 ton many of them we have a statue at Ramsium Temple, and we may visit, uh, we will visit this temple in our uh, next tour. Uh, that statue, one piece, uh, after it was carved, it, it was 1,000 ton. And the base is around 300 ton. So we total 13, uh, 1,000 uh, and 300 ton. And before it was carved, when it was just a block, I think it was around uh, 1,500 tons. So maybe total weight of the, the two pieces, we took about 2,000 tons. So we don't have a tool or a crane in our modern history can carry 2,000 tons as one piece. So if we uh, take that example from the, the temples that they lifted the whole temple, Okay, so we can easily understand how they did this in real life, uh, uh, taking these blocks. And you have seen the unfinished obelisk uh, at the quarry. Yes. Uh, if we skip all the, the steps, how they cut and how they shape, okay, there is a big question how they will take this big piece just outside the quarry. I'm not talking about sending it to Luxor or to Cairo. Just to lift it, yes. yes. Exactly. I'm wondering about how just to take it from that groove, from that pit. Okay. Uh, it it will, I think, if we can do it, if we, and I don't think we have the ability to do it, it will take years to take it just outside the quarry, a few meters outside the quarry. So yes, the, the ancient Egyptians left, in my opinion, they left all their secrets written on the walls. But the problem that we don't read the text in a good way, we don't receive or we don't have the code to decipher the, these writings, okay? Or sometimes we read it in a different way. We apply uh, different stories and different beliefs. Uh, like, like many of the early Egyptologists, they were calling the, uh, the Greek uh, background, the, the Greek stories, and they applied the Greek stories on our art. Uh, by the way, like Isis was called Venus, Hathor was called Aphrodite, uh, Horus was called Hercules. 
That's why many of the ancient Egyptian cities was called Heraconopolis, the city of Hercules. Okay, mm. so, so that was the case. When the Greeks uh, ruled Egypt, they applied their own religion and their own uh, philosophy on the Egyptian religion and the Egyptian philosophy. That's why so many of the information are uh, uh, misinterpreted uh, and misexplained because we see it as a Greek story, not pure ancient Egyptian story. Yes. And I think that you, to me at least, you represent such a powerful, you are to such a powerful place because you are bringing people from all types of disciplines. And I think this is the key. And you're able to decipher and open yourself up through the you know knowledge and, and ability to read the hieroglyphics and right. having all these different angles that are discussing different things with you. Like you just had mm -hmm. a tour with Robert, right? Robert Grant and all the things that are opening up. And this is, I think, is the key is more and more open-minded science and spiritually driven individuals that are coming in to Egypt to explore where we all came from. And you are right there. You are the one guiding people to it. It's amazing. <laughs> I hope uh, to not be the only one for a long time. I hope uh, to, to be able. I started to teach my colleagues. Okay. Not sure. many, but uh, and I I'm hoping in the near future to be able to uh, like teach like hundreds of them. Yeah, okay. happy if there are hundreds, uh, because uh, the, the more we, we have people like this, okay, the more kind of uh, uh, information and and the more we know, the more we will reveal. Yes. So. Yeah. Um, let's uh, like hope with me that uh, we can do this in the near future. Absolutely. And I know that you mentioned it. I'm excited. You are going to publish a book this year at end of this year, correct? Yes, exactly. Very, uh, very excited and looking forward to it. This book will explain so much about the, uh, the prehistoric Egypt and the, uh, the, 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 the normal uh, ancient Egypt we know and will uh, explain many about the uh, Egyptian technologies the technologies of the pyramids and uh, some of the uh, of the unknown or unexplained uh, techniques were used in ancient Egypt that's wonderful so I'm really looking forward to it once it's published I'll be sharing it with my community, your wealth of knowledge, and thank you so much for doing what you do and bringing so much love to your land where you're from. I think it's so important is to be able to receive people with an open heart and you have this ability to share the heart with everyone that comes in contact with you and therefore it translates into the Egyptian experience of whoever is in your presence, I will say. It, it's what makes it extremely special. So, Mohammed, thank you. I know Alejandra and I are absolutely grateful to you, and we are excited to come back. Yeah, when you come to Egypt once, you cannot stop. Keep yes, coming. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thank mm. you so much again, and yeah. have a beautiful evening for you. Okay, you too. <laughs> thank you.